So during the summer, um, David Luckman um, told me about a conversation he had with a man called Alistair. And uh, put me in phone contact with him. I phoned Alistair and he was in New York at the time. I mean, this, you know, it ended up being a, quite a long conversation, but the conversation made sense from the beginning, which was around, you know, we talk about community, yet sometimes we don't know what the community is saying. Like, you know, we, we try to build a community, and then when we reflect, we kind of go, well, what actually does the community want, or what does the community <coughs> think, and have we ever properly listened to them? And, like, this idea of two ears and one, one mouth, you know, it always strikes me as almost ironic in that we talk so much more than we listen yet. We have two organs versus one. So I'm not the expert on it, but the expert on it is Alistair. So Alistair, if you come and join us, please. Alistair Herbert from Thank Lindra. You. Thank you very much. That's very good. I'm, uh, I'm totally aware of the irony, irony of me talking about listening and you're doing the listening. Mm -hmm. um, but I just want to thank the previous speakers. I just think that it's really, really moving hearing about community linked to family hearing about community linked to place, hearing about um, community linked to, to country. Um, I'd also like to sort of extend that to, to um, community linked to, to common experiences. And so I want to bring it, uh, you know, add something to it, which is about the digital side. So we do a lot of listening with people who have illnesses, for example, who share their experiences online, or people who, uh, mothers, who are very, very good at sharing their experiences online. So just to, just to add that extra dimension, but first of all, I'm going to ask you a question. Have you ever seen somebody really good looking, maybe in a bar, maybe at work, and they've, you thought, oh, they look pretty good, and then they've opened their mouth, and your attraction <laughs> sort of disappears in, in, within a minute or so. And really what I want to talk about is about how um, language affects relationships and how listening is really one of the most generous things that you can do. Now, during my adolescence and up to my early 30s, you know, I was, I was a, just a, I, I won medals for talking at all distances, sprint, middle distance, marathon, most of them. And, you know, I was, I was opinionated and I was interesting and I was entertaining. And then I, came, I went through, you know, a breakup of a really, really important relationship was the mother with, of my children. And I realised really something had to change, um, it had to change within me. And I realised that that was about becoming a better listener. So I set myself up to become a better listener and then 15 years later I started a business on it. Um, and I want to share some of those discoveries uh, and to show you how that can relate to communities because I'm going to show you even in your own lives that the I guarantee you that the relationships that you've chosen to be in are very 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 strongly linked by the by a shared language and I'm not talking about what you say not even how you say it but the deeper psychological the deeper psychological content of the language that you use. And I'm going to show you how that works, show you some proof about that, share some experiences with you, and hopefully be able to send you away about giving you some opportunities and some chances to think about being a better listener, not only in your personal life, but how to understand to help that work in, in making communities more cohesive. So let me share uh, an experiment that was involved with... Um, um, We've got a robot called Bob, who I'm going to introduce you to, and, and he's he's uh, he, he's the stepson of a piece of software that was used in some speed dating. So people set up a speed dating, right? Some researchers. This was in the Journal of, of, of Language and Social Psychology. They set up a speed dating night. They said, "Okay, what we need to do is record your conversations. You're okay with that?" People said, "Yeah, yeah, we're okay with that." And also, what we're going to do is. Uh, ask you at the end of each interaction to, to sort of write down quickly the things that you believed you had in common. So you might believe that you're more likely to have a relationship with somebody that you've got things in common with. Okay, but actually it was a very, very poor predictor of these relationships starting. So what happened afterwards, the conversations were recorded and they were analysed by software for the deeper psychological content, and they analysed the things that people had in common. And they found out that people were three times more likely to make a relationship where they matched language styles. Not what they were talking about, not even their voices, 
but the deeper psychological content. And that isn't surprising, because language doesn't come from nowhere. The words that we use, or the types of language we use, are a direct route to what we do. So we work in a commercial environment, and what we're, what we're doing all the time is telling companies to stop talking and start listening and start connecting to the deeper psychology. And language is the fastest route in there. So actually, I'm not really interested in linguistics or semantics. What I'm interested in, and the work that we do, is about connecting communications to people to make it really easy for them to understand. The follow-up follows up, OK? And it was about promoting loyalty. So they said, OK, four months later, who are the couples that are still together? And yet again, three times more likely to be together with someone. So I guarantee the people that you've chosen to have a relationship with, family you have no choice about, but your lovers, your partners, your friends, you do share a, diff a way of thinking, and that comes through language. So this has implications for, for communities. If you want to create a community online, if you want to use communications to make that happen, or, or even to mediate communications, or you want to improve community, community cohesion, be that in a locality, within a family, within, on a national basis, particularly anything over distance, then it's really important to start listening and understanding some of the psychology. And I'm going to share that with you. OK, this is Bob, our own deep listening robot. And we invented Bob for a couple of reasons. One, people are very bad listeners. Very bad listeners. Most people will talk or, or listen to people waiting to say something waiting to make a connection. And I'm very happy to share the stuff over the, over, over the next day or so and, to, and, and give you some uh, absolute clear advice on all of that. The other thing that is really important about Bob, he reads 120 times faster than we do, and he finds that deeper psychological content that I'm going to share with you. Um, and he does it. He does it um, consistently, <coughs> whereas human beings can't. So that means Bob can listen to to lots and lots of people talking in chat rooms and forums and, and to videos and diaries and online panels. That's all very, that all sounds very commercial because that's, that's the area we work in. We've, he's listened to a million words of voters before the election in the United States, 100,000 voters across different communities, and they were talking focused on, on neighbourhoods, what they wanted for their neighbours, what they wanted for their families and so on. And he uncovered lots and lots of really, really important things that individuals who've been reading it painfully we're unable to do it. We don't even read it until Bob says, go and have a listen to this. So what are the sorts of things he listens to? And I want to share this stuff with you so that you can start to get a sense of how you can start to alter the types of language you use to make better relationships for yourselves and to make communities more cohesive. So there are three, we think of uh, words in three types. First of all, there are head words. These are conceptual words. I'll show you examples of these. Then there are body words, which relate to the senses. And then there are what we call picture words. Now, we've already had a reference to finding a metaphor, the murmuration. These words and the picture words are about what, what, not, not what something is, but what it's like. And if you can take these head words and turn them into picture words, you can become more persuasive and you can start to really understand what people are talking about. Can I ask, does anybody here work in HR? Excellent. I can be rude about them. So we do a lot of stuff with HR, uh, and we, we read a lot of stuff, you know, corporate social responsibility types of stuff. Now, conceptual ideas like sustainability, innovation, helpfulness, accountability, you know, these ideas, responsibility, this is the type of language that HR uses all the time. That's why we hate. <laughs> okay, these are conceptual words, and, e and we're going beyond this, actually, even to these, island is a concept, Kong is a concept, your family is a concept, so there are lots of things that we listen to, we, we, I'm, I'm going to show you what we found with some of these, lots of things, even something like, what is motherhood, okay, so we work Johnson & Johnson, I'm going to show you some stuff from that, what is breakfast, what is gardening, you know, what is a trust? What is a New Zealand? What is New Zealand? We, we've worked on understanding what these things are like, so that we're able to connect with them, uh, to connect those communications emotionally. So the problem with these head words is that they force our brains to work too hard. Our brains don't like working. 
Our natural state is to do things automatically, okay? So we're only aware of about 5% of the things that happen to us, 95% of the things that are happening, which is the emotional stuff on which we take our actions. And this is why you can't really believe what people say. So I keep telling people to stop using focus groups because they are really, really bad. Do not ask people why they do things and expect them to be able to tell you why they do things or, or what they will do, because we don't know. You have to find a deeper way of getting to them. But we'll lie to you. People will lie, because we will project about who we want to be. We wish to be seen to, as rational and all the rest of it. You put people into groups, the most important psychological element, if you put people into groups, is safety. So they'll all agree with one another. Okay, so there's lots of reasons why you shouldn't. Now, I've got, I want to talk to you about um, sensory words. Now, sensory words are really, really powerful. You will have literature is full of this. I'm just reading The Ballad of Sad Cafe by Carson McCullough. She is a brilliant, brilliant author. She's just loaded with sensory words. Now, the most important thing about sensory language is that we don't have to think about it because our sensory systems understand what these things are like. So if I say kiss or kick, I'm actually firing up your motor systems right now. If we start using lots of words about heat, I can warm you up just slightly. Okay, so it's, a re it's really important to engage people, emotionally engage people, by using the language of senses. And I'll give you some examples of how that, how that works and how it changes. Okay, so it's important to remember that our entire experience of the world is through our sensory systems. And if you're involved in anything to do with communications, it's really important to recognise that a multi-sensory experience is always better than a single sensory experience. So if you're engaged in communicating with people over the phone, all you've got is your voice. Okay? If you are using digital communications, all you've got is what you look like and what you sound like. Okay, I'm, that's why I keep telling people if people get retail right, it's, it really should work because it's a multi-sensory experience. So your own communications, you know, if you're if you're communicating your email, I take sometimes half an hour to write an email that's only got, you know, eighty words in it, ninety words in it. Why would you waste your time doing that? Well, because you get a project that's worth twenty-five grand if you get it right. You know, just don't bang this stuff out. Start thinking about these things. And I'll show you some examples of what we did. So we listened to um, a, a community of mums in, in the States, <coughs> which is run by Johnson Johnson, and it's called Baby Centre. So we took loads of... We listened to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds... Or Bob listened to hundreds and hundreds of, uh, hundreds of women co covering areas like skincare, bath time and bedtime, and they have different senses. So they start... They've changed the language. So what was interesting about the skin... It was all about what it looked like. So babies with eczema, it doesn't matter. It's not what it feels like because they, the parents don't know what it feels like. Or the mums don't know what it feels like. It's what it looks like. And it was also important that it wasn't owned by the child, that it was something separate. Bath time was all about touch. It was about hair and skin and washing and everything. And, really, and the water, the sensory experience of the water. And bedtime for all parents auditory keep quiet this was also incidentally where the mum started swearing quite a lot <laughs> about babies not getting to sleep so babies being noisy and waking them up and so everybody so this is really important to realize that um i mean like if you start listening to people and your partners and listening to people in communities just pick up what their main sensory areas are so for example we listen to loads and loads of people talking about uh, helpfulness in business and we discovered it was all about auditory language. So we tell people who are involved in, in customer service and so on, don't say to people who, who have an issue, you don't say to them, you know, I can see your point of view, because visual is not emotionally helpful. Don't say, I know how you feel. What you do is say, thanks for talking to us. I've really enjoyed I'm, I'm pleased that you told us that, and I'd like to say that we're really sorry helpful, trigger, 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 trigger. It, so that's an emotional, deeper thing. And that was by measuring hundreds of words of people listening. And helpfulness was, I think, about 325% up on what you'd expect to hear in a normal spoken conversation. So listen to people and understand what their senses are. However, 
the single most important language, and we've been hearing it all the time subconsciously, we are speaking in pictures all the time. So we take these ideas, these conceptual ideas, and we speak in pictures. And I'm going to share with you what those pictures are and how they work. I, I, we don't actually talk very much about metaphor anymore, but fundamentally we call it framing. And it is about describing one thing in terms of another. And this is how our brains wire up. And this is why human beings are so brilliant, because we can describe one thing in terms of another. Now, the choice of language that we use to describe something is really important. That's where the listening really helps. Uh, we spent three years building an entire taxonomy of metaphorical framing and structures, not because we wanted to, but because nobody else had done, done it, damn it, because I don't believe in reinventing stuff. So we've basically taken the work of the best psychologists and automated it. So this is how we think, and I'm going to give you some examples of this, but first of all, I'm going to ask you a question. Okay. And I want to ask you this question, and I want answers, please. What is money? It's the means to survive in the world. The means to survive in the world. Choice. It's exchange. It's choice. Exchange. It's about exchange. It's a promise. It's a promise. Hard-earned. It's hard-earned. Okay, what if I told you that money is water? <coughs> Do you believe me? If you, you're going to believe me, th give me 30 seconds, right, and you're going to believe me that money is water. <laughs> we are constantly using this. This evening, as we walked into the castle, Owen was explaining about the canal, how it didn't work because they were siphoning the money off. Okay, income streams, anybody? And what on earth do banks do? Banks control the flow of money, even the name. So this language is right underneath our noses. And why is it there? It's there because of sensory interactions again. Okay, when we've had, for thousands of years, we've had interaction with, with coins. And they, they sound like water. They flow like water. And they're cool like water. And this wires up our brains, okay? So I'm going to give you some examples of how this works and how it's important in communities. Because most community cohesion is based around a big idea. And that big idea might be family, it might be country, it might be place, it might be someone having cancer or something similar. But it's really important to understand what those are. And I'm going to give you some quick examples of, those, of things that we've looked at. So what is education? We listen to 30 different universities in the United States. We don't know what the answer is, but I, can sh I don't believe that the universities know. What is breast cancer? We work with breast cancer now. We definitely know what breast cancer is. And it's very, very different to the way that cancer, the, the cancer charities in general talk about that. And we did that by listening to women without even asking them any questions. Because how would a woman who is in that condition possibly be able to speak to a researcher asking her direct question? What is success? He listened to thousands of people. I'm going to give you some examples. You're going to tell me, and we might end, if we've got enough time, on what is creativity, to give you some examples of these things. So what is education? Well, we listened to these universities, and they came up with three different ideas. So education is a structure. We build it so you can bring it. And this shows you it's not just about language, OK? This is also about visuals. This guy looks like he might be building something. You know, he's got a firm look in his eye. What is education at, at uh, Western governors? It's transformation. It's higher education, reinvented, an innovative online university. It's a new kind of view. It's all about newness. And actually, you know, that's not a bad picture because she's looking up and she's looking positive. Okay, so there's, there's an aspirational thing here. That's not bad. But also, you've got um, Estrella. And they're saying it's all about movement, OK? Pursue new opportunities to look forward to without putting your life on hold. In other words, lack of movement, OK? So if she's about movement, what on earth is she doing sitting in that <laughs> library looking at her? OK, what this, I don't know what education is, but what this demonstrates is it, that you know, there are different, they can, you can have different 
frames for different things. Um, but if you, if you don't know how people are framing your ideas, then you're just guessing, right? Because if people are really into this idea of building, they're going to go to Strayer. Uh, but I'll, let me give you these examples. Okay, this is cancer. Okay. The cancer charities say we're on a journey to beat the enemy. And these, so here are some examples of the type of language that they use for this. So we analysed all, all of the cancer charities in the UK, eight different cancer charities. And this is the language that they were using. Even uh, Macmillan recently have said, oh, we're not into this cancer as a battle. They were talking about their army of nurses. Okay, now this is not me just saying this. This is Bob statistically measuring this against what we'd expect to hear across hundreds of millions of words. Okay, and I'm going to show you how we measured that. So we then needed to ask women... We needed to discover from women with breast cancer, how are they thinking? But the most important thing to do, how on earth are we going to do that? Well, we brought Bob into this because women were sharing with other women, as women do. Women are so brilliant at supporting and sharing. So they're right, these women were writing blogs. And we found 13 women writing blogs. Two of those women had died. Okay, and their blogs were still up. So we took 13 years' worth of, of writing from these women. Again, it's impossible for a human being to do this consistently and to do it fast. And Bob found that women with breast cancer framed it very, very differently. So for them, breast cancer was not an enemy. It was a force. And they weren't on a journey. The big deal was that their pace of life had been strongly affected. And here's the sort of language that they were using. A terrifying whirlwind. I'll tell you, there was another really interesting thing in here. That was embodiment. Of, that's, that's giving or personification, where something is, is made like a person. So they were, even, they were personifying their cancer, and they were personifying even their medicines. So they would say things like, Tamaxifen and I are not the best of friends this morning. You know, that, the picture of this thing. Just think about these pictures all the time, what it's saying about them. So, for them, breast cancer was a force affecting their pace of life. So what does that mean? We were able to demonstrate to Breast Cancer Now, there were two charities coming together. One, that they framed, these two charities framed between them, cancer slightly differently, and they needed to get it right to save the two years of those two, com those two organisations coming together and that culture going wrong. And so these are the big ideas, movement, journey, all the rest of it underneath. But what you can do is see where the differences are. And this is really, really important, particularly if you have to put a business case in and you need to start understanding people. And what's the, what's the output? So the output was like this. Breast cancer now never, ever, ever talk about cancer as a battle or the journey. So they say world-class research is giving us the power to drive forward. Power is a force. To drive forward is movement. And we even managed to get them to change. Their care, their, their whole care program is called from our moving forward courses. The emotional impacts of the disease. So they're now framing the whole concept, the big idea. What is breast cancer? Well, it's very obvious what breast cancer is. It isn't that obvious psychologically. It's made a massive, it's made a massive impact. What happens is you're, you, know, you can start to get people framed. Yeah, this is the basis of persuasion, incidentally, using this picture language. Subconsciously, we're sharing these with, us, with each other all the time. And just another couple of quick ones. I've got to ask you this. Okay, what is success? Happiness. Happiness. Uh, what is success? <laughs> success is up. Success is elevation. Winning is up. Think about the Olympics. Up go the up go, up go all of the 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 the, uh, the flags go up. Bronze, silver, gold. Okay, World Cup. Up there, there's the fireworks. Here's the World Cup. Here's the captain holding it up on the team's shoulder. Okay, where who's lost the match? <laughs> what happens when flags come down? Okay, this up. This up and elevation thing for success is so powerful. We did a lot, we've done a lot of work with Adidas actually on this. It's so powerful that you, it affects your behaviours. You will feel more positive simply by moving things from the bottom of the page to the marbles from the 
bottom of the page to the top of the page. You will pay more to a busker at the top of the elevator than you will escalator than you will at the bottom. You know, think about all of it. All of this comes back. Do you know this comes right back to our childhood? What happens? What happens? We grow up. We grow up. We we're raised by our parents. Why? Because we look up and we see our parents. Okay, so up is good. So our brain wires up constantly, constant, constant, constant repetition. That up is good. Are you up for this? Or are you feeling a bit down about it? Are you a bit low on this today? How's your energy level? Low? High? Anybody want to pay rise? You think the money doesn't go up. You just have more pay. So we, we, we're using this constantly. So I'm going to close on a, on a, on a, on a quick one about creativity because we're quite proud of this. And it shows that different people can frame things differently. So that's what I say. So it's not always one thing. They can be different things. And then you can find different groups will frame things differently. So we were doing a piece of work with a company called Art Gym that do learning and development stuff for a lot of interesting companies, including Adidas and Sony, and very, very socially aware. They do lots of stuff in, in the communities as, as well around London, and they're starting to do so in China. And they're, uh, uh, everything they do is about creativity and making, helping people be more creative. So what we did was do some listening to learning and development professionals that they had not got an audience with, and also the people, the corporate development people at places like Adidas and Sony that they were selling into. But also we wanted to listen to the general public. And the general public, their big thing was a sensory thing about visual. Okay, so for them, the general public sees creativity as something which is about being artistic. But learning and development professionals thought about it very, very differently. Now, for this, nobody was talking about it, so we had to have telephone conversations. These telephone conversations took no more than eight to ten minutes, and we discovered that something was very different. Okay? Creativity for learning and development people and mentors and trainers who believe that creativity is an important thing is a valuable resource that locked inside us. So they were talking about containers, and what happens about this valuable resource? We've got it, you've got it, I have it, we're human beings, we are all creative. Okay, this is the manifesto that has come out of this. And what comes out of this when it's released is that you're able to make connections that you weren't able to make before. Okay, that's what the language said to us. What happened afterwards, six months later, I oh, will show you, how, I'll show you just quickly how we changed this for them. So they, they changed from doing the usual thing about. Uh, ignite the creativity because creativity was no longer a flame uh, and you hear unleash you know creativity is not an animal think about these patterns and the, uh, not patterns but the but these pictures that people are using if you listen carefully enough they're telling you how they're framing these what it was was about re releasing your greatest human resource your creativity so this whole idea that you've got it, everybody's got it, and you have, to, you have to release it. And six months later, there was a big neuroscience study, and they absolutely backed up what we'd heard. A new study suggests a person's creativity can be identified by examining how connected neural activity is in the brain. In other words, people who are being creative identifying needs for something like a spoon, uh, ideas for what a spoon is or something are actually making more neurological connections. We'd already heard that in the language. <laughs> you know, we'd heard it. And that's how closely language and brains and bodies are put together. So if you'd like to hear it, to do a little bit more, if you, on the Lingua Brand website, we've got, we put some four brilliant videos together. I'd really, really recommend Lake Off on Psychological Framing about place about how you go into, a, how we all go into places and, and, and come and have particular frames, and about the language side as well. These are very, very, we, we, we know Jane Pennebaker very well. These, these are really, really good things, and Celeste Headley is just brilliant on the power of listening. Listen with deeper, it's the most generous thing you can do, and thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you very much, Alistair. Can I tell people, Alistair, about the conversation we had earlier on? Yeah. So one of the things that yeah. Alistair has offered us to do, one of the problems I've always had with congregation tomorrow is that, you know, all these special things kind of happen, all this incredible kind of dialogue, and you wonder, 
has it changed anything? Have perceptions changed or what is kind of going through people's heads? So Alistair is offered us that after congregation, we'd ask people to put about 200 words together just on their thoughts around. You know, Alistair will help me carefully frame this, but it's more <laughs> their, their ideas about community. Just so that Ian, you've blogged your way in. <laughs> and what we want to do is get you to email your way out, okay, and just go free flow, okay, so a blog has a structure to it, okay, we're not remotely interested in hearing any sort of structure, just right after tomorrow, so we give it, you know, by the end of the week, want you to send in an email, uh, otherwise you won't get invited next year, <laughs> uh, and what we're going to do is analyse the blogs that came in at the beginning, and we're going, to, we're going to essentially look at the themes and the emotions and the attitudes in, in the before, and then we'll do the analysis afterwards. And it would be totally anonymised. Everything would just be together. We'll, we'll clonk all of the blogs together, all of the emails together, and we'll get you, we'll get Bob to look at it, and we'll write a report, and you'll, you'll all have uh, access to that. And we'll see if we're actually finding if, there's, if, that, if, if anything's changing. So you say, you're going to ask us, what does community mean to us now after the congregation in 200 words? Well, I'd say you know, I wouldn't limit yourself to 200 right. words. I think you should be, yes, it's, it's free form about community and as it, as, it, as, it, as it is to you now. So we've got a before and an after, okay? And we, we carefully framed one of the, the interesting conversations that I felt we had was that, mm -hmm. and I've done it already in this in, the, in my blundered attempt to explain what Alistair explained much more eloquently, is we try not to contaminate your thinking. We try not to guide you a certain direction. 